So would anybody like to share their definition of what an RD is? I can randomly read some if you don't want to share. <laughs> Did anybody feel that maybe they weren't 100% certain? A few people maybe? Okay, I'm gonna randomly read a couple. Okay, an RD is a registered dietitian. They are educated, experienced men and women who are trained to evaluate patients in a nutritional way and prescribe a nutritional recommendation diet based on the need. Sound pretty good? It's pretty good. I'd say that's definitely under the scope of practice of an RD. Um, I'll do another one. An RD is someone who works in a given place, community, school, hospital, to work towards educating people about correct eating habits in order to increase their overall health. They base their advice on factors in a person's everyday life, such as a socioeconomic status, health, et cetera, to give the most beneficial knowledge and alternatives. I'm gonna eat yours. No, just kidding. Um, I think those are all pretty good. I'll do one more. An RD is a person who gets to know patients or clients on a personal level and grows with them as they learn and work on healthy habits. I think that's true as well. Um, maybe, oh gosh, maybe one more. RD is a certified dietitian that can get into many different career paths. You can counsel your own patients, work at a hospital, work with companies, and much more. They know about food, the nutritional and physiological aspects of the body, and how our health is impacted. It's pretty good. Yeah. So, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics gives this really brief definition of an RD. Say, registered dietitian nutritionists are food and nutrition experts who have met the following criteria to earn the RDN credential. Completed a minimum of bachelor's degree, completed an ASCEND accredited supervised practice program, passed a national exam, and completed continuing professional education requirements to maintain registration. That's really, really brief. It doesn't really tell you what the RD is. It just says they're the expert. So I like some of your definitions where you're branching out into what the RD is. Um, yeah, Shelby. You have to submit a learning plan every five years with what you propose to do for continuing education. And there's all these learning, um, kind of categories. So like if I want to do learning in ethics, if I want to do learning in diabetes, if I want to do learning in oncology, I choose these learning competencies and I propose how I'm going to learn about them in the next five years and what types of activities I'm going to do. And then at the end of that five years, I have to submit my learning plan with documented proof that I actually did them. So I have to save like certificates um, from like webinars I did or different journals that you've read and submitted quizzes on. Um, for me, when I pass my CDE exam every five years, that actually covers the whole 75 units. And if I pass my um, CNSC exam, that also covers the whole 75 units. So technically, I don't have to do any more than that, except the CDE exam requires that you do 75 units in addition to the test, specifically on diabetes education, so I do that too. Um, every year though, the one type of learning that RDs have to do is ethics. So they have to do an ethics learning um, as part of that five-year cycle, and all the other learning is their choice. Johnny, did you have a question? The 75 is for five years. So you could actually save it up to the last month and knock it all out if you wanted. You could do a little bit each year. They just really want you to have the 75 over five years. Um, yeah, anything else? So I would become familiar with what an RD is, um, what an RD can do, maybe some of the RD core competencies. Um, RDs and definitely during like your supervised practice, you'll become kind of experts within community nutrition, um, clinical nutrition, 
food service and food service management. Those are kind of the main titles of your specialties within the internship. And then classes at Cal Poly have also prepared you to excel in those areas. But you can work in a wide, wide, wide variety of situations. I mean, you can work sports, you can work one-on-one, -on -one, you can work pediatrics, you can work schools, you can work hospitals, you know, you can work really in so many different things, public health, global health. Um, lots of different things. So that would be a possible question they could ask you during an interview because um, you're applying, you're like applying for a job. And often during job interviews, they ask you what you actually think the job is about, you know. Um, so that would be a good question. I read your strengths and weaknesses. I just didn't bring them to class. Um, I appreciate that you guys were really introspective. Um, that's really good. I think for the weaknesses, if you can think of a time where maybe you were ever successful at that weakness and maybe like you're not always anxious or you're not always self-conscious or you're not always um, a procrastinator. Maybe was there one time or a few times where you took that anxiety that you usually have and you found a good way to manage it to get through a project or something. So if you can spin your weaknesses into like learning um, opportunities or times where you've grown by trying like a new method to cope with a weakness, I think that can be good. Um, I think some of you guys listed like some weaknesses that could potentially cause a conflict with like interpersonal relationships with people. So I would avoid listing a weakness that might indicate that you don't get along well with others unless you can tell a story of how um, that's like changed and evolved and it's not really a big deal over time. Um, a few people listed like bossy, critical, judgmental, short-tempered. Um, I think somebody listed rude, but I would try to, <laughs> I don't actually think any of you guys are like, actually that was one of my reflections is a lot of the weaknesses you put. I was like, whoa, I would never think that about this person. Um, so I think you guys were a little hard on yourselves. Um, but if there's a weakness or even the word that you chose to describe the weakness might be kind of like a triggering to a potential internship director or like somebody you might be working with. See if there's a different, like more benign, maybe like less abrasive type of word you could use to describe the same thing. Or maybe just pick a weakness that would be kind of less conflict triggering. Um, instead of like judgmental or critical, you could just say maybe like, you really enjoy being like the driving force behind projects. And sometimes you have trouble delegating that to others because your level of um, expectation and perfection is so high or something like that, that you don't want to allow others to do the work, you know? Um, same thing with like bossy, like maybe instead of bossy, um, just that you like to be the leader, you know? Cause that's kind of, could be similar. Um, a few people put brain fog, and I totally know what brain fog is because I experience it often. But I don't, I don't know if it's like a weakness or just like a passing kind of thing. You know what I mean? Were, were you guys any insight on brain fog? I can't just can't focus. Yeah. So, I think that's a weakness. I think right? definitely not being able to focus is a weakness. Um, yeah. Maybe, yeah. So, maybe you would say, like, sometimes I have difficulty focusing, you know, but think of a time where, like, maybe you had to focus to get something done and how whatever you did to, like, allow yourself to, like, be in that moment and focus on the task at hand to complete it. You're going to say, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm going to say, maybe for me when that happens. I haven't been taking care of myself very well, so it's like that could be maybe brain fog. Like, I stayed up late too late, or I didn't eat breakfast. Yeah, yeah. And a few people put like self care, and I agree. Like that's one I definitely suffer from sometimes. Like you don't go to sleep early enough, or you, 
you know, you've been just running at like a hundred miles an hour, just like with things that you have to do and things that you sign up for and that stuff. Um, I think you guys had a lot of weaknesses that actually in the certain situation could be strengths. So maybe find a situation where sometimes this is a weakness, but once in a while it actually has worked out for you. Um, yeah. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't, some of you guys, like, I think you were overcritical of yourselves. So maybe choose one of your like less bad weaknesses. <laughs> Cause I don't think you guys are this weak as the way you guys described yourself. <laughs> um, or definitely not always that way. You know, you guys have made it to senior year or maybe fifth year or whatever at Cal Poly and you guys have done something right, probably a lot of things right to make it this far. So even if maybe you felt that you've been un unorganized or you didn't have good time management, there must have been some times where you really shined through those things, you know, and you, you found what works for you. Um, but anyways, that's that. So DI choices. Um, well, one more thing I did fix the GPA calculator for like the third time, but I'm pretty sure it's actually working because Jordan came to my office and we tested it. So I fixed the, D the DPD GPA calculator. Um, I put it on PolyLearn. I added what you're supposed to put in for like the plus and minus grades. So you'll do the grade units here, the letter grade, the grade points will come from here. And then the quality points is gonna be the um, number of units times the grade points. So that's what the quality points is gonna be. So if you got an A in like a five unit class, you get more points for that than if you got an A in like a three unit class. Um, and like Jordan came from a school that had semesters. So we had to convert some of her semester units to quarter units. Um, and so some of her semester classes she took were actually worth six quarter units, you know, so you might have to think about that too. Um, for every quarter, well, for every semester unit, you get one and a half quarter units. So she had like a semester class that was four units and we multiplied that by one and a half and that gave her six units. Um, so you might have to think about that too. That can be really beneficial because if you did well in a six unit class, it's really gonna you know, help your GPA. Um, so we, we played with this a little bit. Also, um, if you came from a community college or transferred in a place where they did like a lecture grade and a lab grade, you might have to add a row and enter in like that lecture grade, lab grade separately if that's how the units transferred over. Um, and I can help you do that, but yeah. Yeah. yeah I, like 15, I will update the 1517. This one I think is the 1719 and I have the 1920. So actually, you know what? I shouldn't have to update the 1517 because Dr. Grant made that one. So I haven't. Oh, really? On PolyLearn? Hmm. I will then make sure that that is updated. Yeah, I will. Yeah, I'll make sure that that's updated. I'll find it somewhere in the cloud and I will add it. Um, but yeah. And if you're in an older catalog than this too, let me know. So I'll add that. Um, and I think that's all I was going to say. Well, two more things. Um, I learned, and I don't remember if I told you guys this last time, but I learned that you don't actually have to be registered to FENCI to go to the career fair. You're looking at me like I told you this already. Did I tell you that? No, so FENCI has a cost to go to the conference, but the career fair is held at a um, hotel outside of the conference. So I just got an email last week saying that if you're not registered for FENCI, you can still go to the career fair, um, which could be good if maybe you just wanted to do like a short trip, you didn't wanna pay the money to go to Fancy, but you still wanted to meet all these programs. Um, so I just added that here. And then I got more open house 
um, listings. And so I posted them there. The VA Los Angeles, they said they're specifically looking for applicants for their MPH, Masters in Public Health program, because they didn't get a lot of applicants. So if that's your thing. Um, they want you to apply. So yeah. Okay. So now I will go to internship choices. So DI choices, how do you decide? It could be kind of one of the tougher decisions that you make with this process. Um, there are a lot of things that you can consider or places you can start. You can start with where Cal Poly grads have matched. That document is on SPAS. So there's a list on SPAS of where Cal Poly grads have ever matched. And actually, I've been working um, on this list. So I've been working on the list to fill it in to get the contact info of all of these previous interns. So that's, that's having me go back in time um, and find all their contact info. So far, I've gone back to 2016. So I'm compiling a list. This is the list of where Cal Poly students have ever gone. And eventually I'll have these all filled in with who went to which one and a contact info for them. So that if you wanna go to one of these programs, I can look back at this document and I can say, okay, Rochelle went there. Here's her email, you know. Um, it's just, I'm having to go back through every year and kind of fill this in, so it's taking me a little while. But I will have this, so you could look at that. The good thing with this is they'll know Cal Poly's reputation and hopefully that person well represented the college and they'll be like, oh yeah, Michelle was a great intern. We love Cal Poly students. That's what we usually hear, um, and that's what we hope you guys will do as you guys represent us in the future. But you could look at, you know, you can come to me with a list like that. Um, you can talk about RDs that you know. If you know any RDs, like in your hometown, you can ask them where they did their internships. Um, you can ask RDs on campus, like Katie Facilius, Carrie Paloa, myself, Michael Lafrano, um, Heather Donovan, Sherry Ellison, we're all registered dietitians. You could talk to any of us where we went or experiences about that. Um, open houses are great because you can ask questions and usually people who are going there right now, interns are at the open houses to talk about their experiences. Um, and then reaching out to others, I kind of just said that, so yeah. Some of the advice, so it doesn't really matter where you get in as long as you get in. And I think I spent way too many months losing sleep over where I would apply and how I would rank the programs I applied to. That's you. <laughs> um, also, I would say to stress to them to not only keep their notes from classes like metabolism, but also keep and organize their work from classes like food service, clinical, and nutrition education, so you can efficiently find and utilize them in the program. That's Nikki Taylor Benedictine MSDI. Um, and this is something Dr. Grant really stressed is be flexible, be open-minded, especially for these just DI programs. Some of them are seven to nine months, 10 months, 11 months. It's not that long of a time in your life, in your overall scheme of your life to go maybe live somewhere else or try out a new city or be exposed to a new environment. Um, maybe go somewhere you've always wanted to go, you know? you can always come back to home wherever home is, you know, um, but maybe kind of go out in the world a little, a little bit and see you, you might find you really like a place. You might find you really don't like a place and you're like, no, that validates how much I love where my hometown is. You know, um, you might be surprised if you have an education trust. I don't know a lot of people who do, but this was Dr. Grant's slide, but you might be lucky. Or <laughs> if you're willing to take on debt, um, which may end up being a lot of you guys by default, not necessarily by enthusiasm, but by default. Um, the thing with some of these high cost programs is they don't get as many applicants. And so in some ways they can be a little bit less competitive and they're very high quality. They're not 
like poor quality programs. They're usually in state-of-the-art facilities. You have really good experiences, um, access to technology, resources, networking, um, different opportunities available. So for example, um, Oregon Health Science University, pretty expensive. Um, we actually have four students there now. Rush University, we've never had anybody go to Rush. It's in um, Chicago, but it has a huge teaching hospital. So they train physicians, nurses, PAs, etc. And teaching hospitals are different than regular community hospitals because teaching hospitals are set up to teach. So often they'll have like operating rooms where there's a room next to the operating room with a two-sided mirror or a window so you can observe different things, you know. They'll have um, simulation laboratories, they'll have computer laboratories. They might have more kind of like medical dummies, you know, or um, things like that. Um, Tufts is in Boston, Massachusetts. They had 33 applicants last year and eight spots. Um, the tuition is about $20,000 a year but they do have financial aid. It's also a really good hospital. Um, College of St. Elizabeth, that's in New Jersey. They have an MSDI program. Last year they had 65 applicants, but they had 36 spots. So that means like one out of two people who applied got in. Um, they're also about $20,000 a year, but they allow you to work the first year and the summer. So they, some programs will specifically say we don't want you to work, but they will allow you to work. Um, their minimum science GPA is 2.8 and DPD GPA is 3.2. So it's not so, so competitive. Um, they also allow something called assessment of prior learning, which you can find on the second page in that uh, binder that's going around. Assessment of prior learning means you can get credit towards those 1,200 hours of internship you have to do from previous work or volunteer experience. So um, I have two students in mind that I'm thinking of. One is Justine Heath, which maybe some of you guys know. She's been in restaurant management for, I don't even know, like seven, eight years. Like she runs multiple subways locally. She is like the go-to person and she has so much experience with ordering, budget, scheduling, like everything. So if she were to go to one of these types of programs, she could tell them about her experience, show the hours she's worked, and they might give her credit so that she doesn't maybe have to do three weeks or four weeks of food service management. Maybe they're going to say, you already have this down, you know, Maybe just do a week to see what it's like in the hospital, do a week to see what it's like in schools, but really you have the basics and the foundation down. So that could lead to somebody maybe completing their program earlier than the normal time um, or having more time for electives. I also have Siobhan Burns, um, who's in, an, in a program right now, but she is the food service director at one of the nursing homes locally. So she does everything for the nursing home. Um, and she did that throughout college. Um, and so she'll probably be getting some hours towards her internship. So you can look at that too, you know, maybe the cost is expensive, but if I could finish this a little early, would it be cheaper? Would at least my cost of living be cheaper? Things like that. Um, yeah, combined programs. We talked about student loans. You can also ask about scholarships if there aren't any scholarships that are like obviously listed on the website. If you did go to an open house or a virtual open house, that would be a good place to ask, like, are there any scholarships available or are there any stipends? Um, the academy has scholarships. Sometimes individual colleges have scholarships. Um, sometimes hospitals have scholarships, things like that. Okay, applicant guides. So this is what's getting passed around, but you also have this as PDF, um, which are a little easier to read and excel on um, SPAs. But this is a nice just two-page thing with all of the information that's in that giant Excel sheet, but in kind of, in my opinion, a slightly easier way to look at it. Um, and this can be good when you're looking at, okay, how long is clinical? How long is community? How long is management? And then within clinical, 
where do I go? You know, they're going to have us at an academic medical center, outpatient clinic, pediatrics, and you're going to see all of these specialties. They pretty much said everything except for burn care. In community, you're going to go to schools, food bank, co-op extension, meals on wheels, senior services, public health. Uh, community clinics program. You're not going to go to child services. You're not going to go to fitness and wellness. Um, you can also look at the management, where you're going to go and how long it is. Staff relief is usually where you go back to your clinical or food service rotation and you act as the RD. So you're actually doing a lot of the work for them. And then non-traditional non and specialty practice this might be anything extra they have, or it could be elective where you can go wherever you want. This one um, has one week non-traditional, it doesn't say what, and two to six weeks specialty practice. So that could be, ex that could be an elective unit. Um, like right now, Olivia Wines, she's in Montana and she has four weeks of elective. So maybe if you go to a program that doesn't necessarily have a specialty that you're super passionate about, but you have two to four weeks of elective, you can spend that two to four weeks doing whatever that is that you're really passionate about, you know, and going somewhere else. Um, so this is really good. And it also tells you how many people who have applied over the last few years, how many they accepted. On the second page, it has some costs. Um, it's just pretty, pretty helpful. Um, other considerations, I'll talk about these on the upcoming slides. So I mentioned prior learning, and then um, I think most of this will be covered on the upcoming slides. So emphasis, you can go into the Excel document or just look in the binder or PDF, and you can do an alphabetical search by emphasis. So if you're really into community, clinical, um, geriatrics, pediatrics, eating disorders, um, Emerging trends, you can search by that, and then you can go find out how many weeks of that you're gonna get. All internships will expose you to the three core competencies, which is like food service management, community, and clinical, but some have like two weeks of community or two weeks of food service, and some have, you know, 15 weeks of clinical. I saw one that had 30 weeks of clinical today, you know, so you might want to just think about that. I wouldn't let it deter you from applying, you know, just because they don't focus on one thing or the other, but it could be a reason that maybe you rank an internship higher than the others, or maybe something you could talk about in your personal statement, or if you got an interview, like I'm really interested in this one because <coughs> I'm really passionate about rural communities. And blah, 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 you know? Why are you passionate about the rural communities and you think this would be a great opportunity to maybe, you know, learn more about that and you haven't had much experience doing that here at Cal Poly. So you could use this as a reason um, to talk to. Okay, clinical. So if you like clinical, it was kind of funny. I had my 429 class yesterday, which some of you guys were in. And I taught the enteral nutrition lecture, which most of you guys probably remember. And then I asked some students if they wanted to VRDs, because I couldn't really remember who did or not. And one of them said, not after that. <laughs> but clinical is not all like enteral nutrition or tube feeding or, you know, it does seem like a lot of math when we're in our lab. Um, and a lot of writing, but it, it's really talking to people a lot, you know, and sometimes less math. A lot of the online charting has um, equations and formulas built into the program where you just plug in numbers, you know. Um, Shelby. So, if you were commercial, like, data, you can do that like, as a dietitian, yeah, you would chart every day, okay. yeah. But the items that we write are like much shorter than the eight items that you guys are writing in class. Yeah, you guys are writing kind of long ones in class to get the practice of the kind of the skeleton of the eight item, everything that should go into the eight item. Um, when I write an eight item, I might not relist all of the anthropometrics. I might not relist all of the labs because that can be found in the medical record. 
And when a doctor like pulls up my note to read, he's already seen all that, you know, and it's, it's in there. He just clicks on the tab, it says labs or clicks on the tab that says anthropometrics. But I would highlight ones I'm concerned about still. Um, I might also not write such an extensive like patient history. I might just focus on like exactly what the diet part is about because the doctor has already written the patient history. He knows that they're, you know, this 36 year old African American female who does X, Y, and Z. Um, he or she knows. Um, the, the diagnosis would be identical. The intervention would probably be identical and the monitoring and follow-up would be identical. And that would be for like an initial assessment. But once you've done an initial assess, an initial assessment, you usually have a much shorter second, third, fourth, fifth, like follow-up assessment where you don't rewrite the whole story again. You just really focus on what's changed from last time, you know, and progress that's been made. So I would say my, my usual like first assessments are about, I don't know, two thirds to a page depending. And then a follow-up assessment might be a half a page or something. Um, Sometimes shorter though. Sometimes you follow up with a patient and they're doing all the things that you were hoping they would do. And you write a few sentences, you know? And, and in hospitals, I wrote more lengthy assessments than I do in um, renal. Because renal, I'm really only focusing on a few parameters. So my assessments are much shorter. And a lot of places also have in the electronical medical record where you're checking boxes instead of actually typing out these long things. Like for even the PES statement, you could pull down a drop down menu for the P, you know, the E, the S, et cetera. Um, or check boxes on like BMI over this, you know, recent weight loss, trouble swallowing, um, things like that. But yeah, if you, <laughs> Clinical can be a lot of things and there's different types of clinical, you know, you could be doing like outpatient clinical, you could be working with pregnant moms and um, gestational diabetes, you could be doing WIC, WIC is a little community and a little clinical, you could be in a hospital, you could be in a doctor's office, you could be um, doing education, you could be at a clinic, you know, you could be doing a lot of different things for clinical. Um, if you like clinical, or you think you might like clinical, one thing you do, you can look at the list of the best hospitals. These hospitals have like lower mortality, lower morbidity, shorter length of stays, less infections, good sanitation, better facilities for patients, yeah. Well, like, so the three main areas are gonna be like clinical, community, food service management. So if you really like clinical nutrition, like from our classes here, and maybe experience as like a diet aid or diet tech or volunteering, um, going to a place where you're exposed to good clinical settings would be kind of beneficial. So like in San Luis Obispo, we've got French Hospital, we've got Sierra Vista Hospital, we've got Twin Cities, Templeton, we've got um, Marion. Marion is a much bigger facility than it used to be, but we don't really have big hospitals that will expose you to a wide variety of patients. So like when I did my internship, I never saw a burn patient. Um, I never saw a pediatric patient unless they had like broken their leg or something, but I never went into the, the um, NICU. Um, I never saw like an acute transplant patient. I just, there were certain patients that I didn't see because our hospitals weren't advanced enough to take care of those patients, you know? Where if you go to a big hospital, they're gonna have whole floors full of those patients. You know, they're gonna have like a cardiac floor, a burn floor, a transplant floor, a GI floor, a urology floor. You I mean, they're just gonna have like so much that you could be exposed to a wider variety of patient scenarios, you know, than if you're at a smaller type of a hospital. Um, so I think that could be interesting too. I mean, you might, you might work with patients with like cystic fibrosis or, you know, something, something more interesting than what you're going to see here. When patients are really sick in this area, 
we send them somewhere else. You know what I mean? And maybe you're like, I don't want to see the really sick patients. <laughs> but when they have a kind of more complicated diagnosis, they go to a center that is better prepared to take care of them, higher level of expertise, different types of equipment, different types of technology, you know, specialized rooms, specialized beds, specialized therapies, things like that. So you could have a broader experience maybe going to one of these really nice like big hospitals. Um, and you won't do all your clinical in a hospital. And so like looking back on this page, you can see where your clinical is. Um, if you don't like hospitals, maybe you'd rather be at a clinic, you know, maybe you'd be at a small medical center, maybe you'd rather be long-time care, state hospitals, academics, rehab, and then you can see the types of diseases you'll see as well. So if you're really interested in bariatrics, you could pick a hospital where you work with bariatric patients, you know. Um, I didn't see a lot of bariatric patients, mostly they go to Santa Maria and Santa Barbara, you know, but there are whole hospitals that specialize in bariatric surgery, which I think is pretty fascinating topic, but I didn't get to see a lot of that. Um, so you can look at that. Um, what else? Oh yeah. If you, so you could also use this in your application. Like I really want to go to Mayo because, or Mayo, whatever, because it has this fabulous reputation and it's well known for this and it just got these awards and you know, I feel really happy working in a place that is, has such prestige, you know, um, things like that. This is, if clinical is not your thing, if you just listened to my intro lecture yesterday, um, I wish I would have known that clinical isn't as bad as I anticipated. I excluded applying to some programs because of the emphasis on clinical experience, thinking that I wouldn't like it. Don't get me wrong, clinical is challenging and intimidating, but totally doable and more enjoyable than I expected. Cal Poly really does a good job at preparing us for these rotations. Keep your clinical notes and take them with you. I'll also say the benefit of being at a bigger hospital versus a smaller hospital is when I interned at Twin Cities, there was one RD. Actually, there was one full-time RD, one part-time RD. So I only got the knowledge from these two people. Um, where if you're at a big hospital, even like a Tascadero State Hospital, I think they have like 10 dietitians. You know what I mean? So you're gonna get 10 different perspectives, perspecti, perspectives, perspectives. I don't know. You're going to get 10 different experiences um, from these 10 different people. And that can also be a plus if maybe you didn't like that first dietitian you worked with so much. Don't worry because in two weeks you're going to work with this other dietitian, you know. Um, but you might, at a big hospital, you might be able to work with a dietitian whose specialty is cardiac, whose specialty is bariatrics, whose specialty is renal, and really like get a lot of diverse knowledge from a broader range of people versus if you're at a smaller hospital, um, you might just get a couple. So that, that's another thing. It's about attitude. Yeah, it's, it's really what you make of it. Like it's just a year or two if you're doing the master's, but you could do anything for a short period of time. All the rotations have endings, so none of them are gonna go on forever. Um, every experience is a learning experience, and sometimes, to be honest, we learn a lot more from the negative or difficult experiences than the easy or pleasurable experiences. We really do learn more when things are hard or difficult or when we struggle than when it's just a walk in the park, you know? We don't remember those walks in the park, but we remember that time that something was challenging and somehow we managed to get through it and we're still alive at the end of the day, you know? Um, so she said, I watched some of my peers have some bad experience in their rotations. However, I would go to the same sites and have a completely different experience. I think this all has to do with attitude, perspective, professionalism, and general people skills. Um, she went to Sam Houston. They have like an MSDI program. They have, they have 10 spots and last year they had 40 applicants. So not bad for 10 spots. They do five weeks of research. So if you like research, that's something that they do there. Um, or if you hate research, <laughs> you could survive research for five weeks though. You know what I mean? They do give a little mini stipend. They give 20, uh, they give $2,500 
the tuition for residents is eleven fifty the first year, but um, three thousand eight hundred the second year. So it's much cheaper the second year. The second year that stipend would almost pay for the cost. For non residents, it's twenty two thousand the first year and um, seven thousand five hundred the second year. So. It's not the most expensive program out there. They do provide financial aid, but it's just one of them. So, pediatrics. Okay, so generally pediatrics isn't entry level, but you can get a lot of pediatric experiences in your DI. And um, again, like looking at this document, ooh, this one. Um, you can look through here of where things are going to be. So will you be at a pediatric hospital? Will you see pediatrics there? Um, will you see eating disorders? That's probably going to be mostly in younger people. Will you be in a NICU for community? Are you going to go to child services, schools? Um, you can't see WIC on here, but WIC is here. So are you going to go to WIC? For management, if you're going to be in a public school, you're going to be with children. So if you're really into pediatrics and it doesn't have a pediatric specialty, you could look at all these spots and say, well, does it at least go to a pediatric hospital? Do I at least go to schools? Do I go to WIC? Does the hospital I'm gonna be at have a NICU? Um, and then you can look down here too for non-traditional and specialty. And they have like neonatal, pediatrics, eating disorders, um, things like that. Maybe private practice, you could be with a, a, re, a dietitian who does pediatrics. So you can select one that doesn't specialize in pediatrics, but will still give you an opportunity to do a lot of pediatrics. And I would say that about almost any concentration. Um, you know, like if you were sports or wellness, you could pick places that are more sports or wellness oriented. Um, oh, okay. Other things about pediatrics. So some places like Fresno, we had two students at Fresno right now. Um, actually, both of our grad students got into Fresno this year and are there, but Fresno goes to Valley Children's Hospital for a big part of their rotations, and so you'll get pediatrics. Fresno is not expensive to live in. You know, it's not that far from the coast. It's really not that far from anywhere in California because you can hop on the five and, and get places. Um, Children's Hospital Colorado, Riley Peterson and Alana Hunter. So this is Riley and Alana Hunter. They made like some teriyaki pineapple chicken and then they were sampling it to the kids at the hospital. The kids would try it and then put their toothpick in like that they liked it, they didn't like it. Um, but that's a specific children's internship. I believe that uh, Alana worked there as a DTR first and then got in, and I think Riley just applied and got in. Yeah, switched, okay, switch that. Riley worked there as a DTR first, and Alana applied and got in, yeah. That's a good question. Different states have different rules about that, but that could be a good strategy too, is if you're wanting to go out of state, check out what the state's rules are about like resident versus non-resident, and go live there for a year. If you can get your residency, work for a year, save money, and then that's gonna cut your tuition in half, that would totally be worth it. Plus, if you do go out there for a year and you're like, I love this place, you might think of other places in that state you wanna apply to if you're like, I don't know if I could stay here another year, you know? But go out and visit these places. But that's a really good strategy, is maybe go work there for a year, then you can get in-state tuition. Um, Children's Hospital LA, they require you to have your master's degree. I don't see my grad student. Do you have any grad students, Jordan? I had another one that sometimes is in the back, but Jordan, you can go there. Um, they require you to have your MS to apply. Um, if, so if you're thinking maybe you're just going to get your MS first, then you could apply to Children's. Once you guys all graduate, you guys can all take your DTR exam and they will allow you to work as a DTR at their hospital while doing the internship. So they'll pay you to work at their hospital and allow you to do the internship at the same time. Um, 
So although you have to have the masters, there is that kind of perk. Um, other things, they give you $3,000 a year stipend. It looks like their tuition from what I could find, it said their tuition was 14,000, but then on the stipend, it said they give you 3,000, but then it said they cover 50% of the cost. And I was like, 3,000 isn't quite 50% of 14,000, but they give you something so you could find out more, you know? Um, and honestly, $11,000 $11, isn't that bad for an internship. Um, they have GPA 3.0, they rank personal statement first. So they wanna know why you wanna go work with children, you know, more than anything else. Um, University of Mississippi, they have child and adolescent nutrition, and they have, so they have eight spots. They only had, in the last two years, they had 16 to 28 applicants. So not that many people applying there. Um, they also have a secondary concentration in sports nutrition and management. They had their applications due January 15th of last year. Um, they say they do have tuition assistantship available, but I couldn't really figure out how much. Um, and the cost was like 8,000 a year for residents versus 23,000 a year for non-residents. So you would wanna look into that more, like what kind of assistantship is really actually gonna be given to you. Um, other areas of focus, I sorted them and you can find internships with all of these areas of focus. So whatever you're interested in, they're out there. Um, Washington State MSDI, they're a pretty, pretty uh, competitive program. Um, we had one applicant get in there the first round of matching, but then two more get in the second round. And they have a focus on exercise physiology. Um, their program is called Nutrition and Exercise Physiology. They're a combined program, MSDI. If you're interested in them, they recommend you do some undergrad work in exercise physiology. I think they have two classes that they want you to try to take. But for the students who did the second round match, they hadn't done those classes, so they still allowed them to come and take them like during the internship. But they prefer if you've taken like um, an exercise physiology class. They have 3.0 minimum GPA. They allow you to work and do like a work study combo. So there's opportunities. Um, geography. This is Olivia. Where is she? That's Olivia. Um, she is in Montana right now. Um, Montana is beautiful in the summer and she sent me some really beautiful pictures from the summer. And in the winter, it's really, 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 really cold. Um, I just looked up some weather from like last year. It was like December 3, 2 below zero. December 6, 16 below zero. December 8, 19 below zero. So it's really, really, really cold. Um, I would die there. I could never, <laughs> ever, ever, ever survive that temperature. Um, but she really loves outdoor sports. She loves skiing, you know, she loves wintertime. So she's like, this is cool, you know. Um, in Montana, Montana only has one internship in the entire state. So they spend, the interns spend their first four weeks in Bozeman, Montana. And then after that, there's seven different like geographical areas in Montana that they're dispersed to. So they're pretty spread out across the states. So you would want to know like, okay, how far am I from Bozeman? Or, you know, what do I do for those first four weeks? Do I move to Bozeman and then I go move somewhere else kind of thing? Um, how does that work? And she would be more than willing to talk to you. Um, yeah, she loves it. This was her, they were learning how to cook in a Dutch oven because a lot of people do like Dutch oven cooking there. So they were giving random ingredients and told to make a meal with this Dutch oven. Um, there's not a lot of traffic there. The cost of living is pretty low, but you have to think about things, you know, the weather, um, natural disasters, the climate, recreational opportunities, you know, what's important to you, length of the days, you know, I know, Alaska, you're <laughs> from Alaska. The days are, are really, really long in summer and really, really, really short in winter, you know? Just all sorts of things. Um, so 
this is this is what she said about location. So I know Dr. Grant always stressed this, and many of us didn't like or want to hear it, but it's true. Be open-minded in terms of location. Nobody wants to hear this, and everyone wants to be stay in California, even those not in California. So we have a lot of applicants from out of state to California, which makes California pretty competitive. Um, is highly, highly competitive. Don't be afraid for a new adventure elsewhere. This is your time to explore and be open to the experience. With that said, don't take yourself out of the running if California schools are still what you want, but consider others as a backup. We have grads in California programs doing great things. Um, so you guys can do this, you know, you can do, you can go anywhere really. Um, and it's short, it's not, it's not a long time. This is not, for me, this is somebody wrote about Dr. Grant. So step out of your comfort zone, apply programs outside of California, really, really follow that. The years that we have the highest match rates for our students are years that students are willing to go places besides maybe here, you know. Um, we've had students go literally all the states. Um, and I have some of the last ones on my map. You, yeah, you don't have to be there that long. Some states, I mean, California is expensive. We have expensive tax, we have expensive gas, we have traffic in the bigger cities, um, expensive rents. It's one of the highest costs of living in the United States being in California. So you could look at this as an opportunity where yeah, I have this fee for my internship, but hey, my rent is really cheap and gas is $2 a gallon or whatever it is. Um, Think about things like that. This is from Dana Baki. She was one of my students. Um, this is her, and she is almost done with her program. She's in a combined program. Um, she had a lot of good things to say about her program. They only have a year and a half, so it takes her a year and a half to get her MS and DI, which is really fast. Um, she does lots of clinical, she does lots of research, she really likes her program director. Um, she gets to go to the VA, where the VA gives her a little bit of a stipend for part of it. But this is what she said about the geography. So the only challenge is that it's located in Cleveland, which is a big adjustment from California in terms of the culture and climate. I think there are some nice areas and definitely fun things to do, which I'd be happy to discuss with future students, but it was quite an adjustment. However, for me, the benefits absolutely outweighed the negatives as long as the student is willing to make an effort to become friends with the other interns or has some other connections to people in Cleveland. Otherwise, it might be hard to live in a city without close friends. Hope this is helpful. I'd be willing to answer other questions. She's gonna be at Fancy this year. Um, and I think that I've heard this time and time again from interns is when you do get into your internship, form those relationships with other interns in your relationship because they're in the same boat that you are. You know, they're in the exact same boat you are. They've come from probably somewhere other than their hometown to a place that's new. They don't know people. They want to make friends. They're going through the same rotations as you, so they probably have some of the same struggles. Um, they might have learning that they can share with you and they can kind of actually be like your lifetime friends and your lifetime network. You know, I'm still friends with people that I was in my internship with, you know, and one of them specializes in pediatric nutrition. Um, you know, one of them is a chef, one of them does uh, wellness, you know, but it's nice to have those connections. They can also be future job opportunities, you know. Um, alternative locations, Puerto Rico. If you don't speak Spanish, unfortunately, you can't go. But I know I have some Spanish speakers in the class. Or if you want to learn it really, really quick, maybe. <laughs> Crash course. Um, but, uh, hey, it's in Puerto Rico. Um, they pay you to go. And what more needs to be said, you know? <laughs> but they, ha they have metabolic clinic. They actually, as one of their concentrations they listed social media video production um which i've never seen as kind of a focus but maybe they do a lot of like outreach videos which would be cool that would be an example of nutrition informatics which some of you guys had on your quiz yesterday um they also have a pediatric specialty they do two weeks of community 30 of clinical 10 of management and then they do like a three-week orientation um so could be a cool opportunity. A cool opportunity to go somewhere else. Yeah.
Well, Port, like Puerto Rico is considered a U.S., yeah. so it's okay. If you were to go to somewhere else, I think for Canada, the repro the re the reciprocity, reciprocity. <laughs> <laughs> Canada and the United States get along. Um, they have reciprocity. Reciprocity, I think, from Canada and the United States is easier. Um, I haven't heard of as good reciprocity from other countries. Um, so you would want to like research that m more thoroughly um, because I don't think other countries. So other countries aren't following like the ascend standards necessarily and they don't have to meet the ascend competencies or that time and hours. And so if you had an RD from another country, but it didn't meet those standards, I don't know that a, a governing board here would grant you reciprocity. Um, so, but I have heard of it working out from Canada before. Okay, other things you could look at, number of applicants odds. Um, I wouldn't let you slow this down, but you can search or make your own little Excel by how many applied last year and how many spots they had. So like, what was the ratio? Did one out of 10 get in? Did one out of four get in? Did one out of 20 get in? You know, kind of how competitive was it? I wouldn't let this deter you. We've had lots of students get into competitive programs. Um, Allie Miller, for example, last year, they had 95 applications and they only accepted six and she got in. Um, so that's pretty good, you know? Um, but you never know what's gonna happen. Sometimes other students are in the same boat you are and they might look at these numbers and be like, I'm not gonna apply there, like it's way too competitive. Well, if everyone decides they're not gonna apply because they're afraid it's too competitive, nobody applies. <laughs> And so some really good programs had openings in second round match, you know, or they said, we got candidates, but none of them were actually what we were really wanting. We want people to apply again. They opened up the applications again, you know. Um, so you, you never really know, but you can look. I would just say don't let it scare you too much. You can look at how they rank them. This is a, a sheet that I made on Excel. Um, but you can, I searched them by the minimum GPA to kind of the highest GPA, but also how do they rank? And it actually goes, I think, till six different ranking criteria. So if GPA is really strong, maybe look at one with GPA. If GPA is not so strong, maybe look at personal experience, work experience, personal statement, um, references, you know, like this one. University of Minnesota, personal statement, references, interview, volunteer experience. So they don't even have GPA as their top four, you know. But think of your strengths. Do I have great references? Think of, you know, your personal statement. How do you feel about it? You know, think of, do I have good interview skills, you know? And maybe do a little bit of strategizing based on that. Um, Lacey, okay, combined programs. So this is good advice, and I think I've already said this, um, but sh this is Lacey. She's at Washington State Combined MSDI. So she said, anyone interested or who even thinks they're interested in combined programs, start researching programs now. That's the best advice ever. Um, a lot of programs require you to apply to the graduate program separate from the diecast application to be accepted into both schools. If you match, you'll get into the graduate program at the school. And those separate applications are mostly due in December to January. Most of them are. Not all, but most of them are, um, depending on the school. When I was applying a year ago and still unsure of what I wanted to do, this ended up limiting my options big time as I didn't realize this until January when it was too late for many programs. Luckily, Oregon Health Sciences didn't require this, was my first choice anyway, so no harm done. But she waited till Christmas break to really like start looking at programs. And then once she looked, she was like, well, I would have wanted to go here, but the application was already due, you know, or the application's due in a week and I, I can't do it, you know, or I didn't get the references or whatever. So at the very least, look now. Um, it never hurts to look, you know. Spend an hour looking, you know, if you're even thinking about that. Some of the combined programs don't use diecast, and I have on our PolyLearn site the non-diecast ones. Um, 
some of the programs that don't use diecast will let you know before the diecast matching if you've gotten in or not. So that can be kind of nice um, because you might, it kind of takes that stress away of having to guess like where you're going to get in, you know, they'll notify you generally early. That can be good. Um, I've listed a couple here. We have um, Bailey's at Loma Linda right now. Dr. Lafrano went to Loma Linda. Um, they have Masters of Public Health. They also, Loma Linda is one of the blue zones where people live the longest. Typically vegetarian diets, uh, Loma Linda. It's a Seventh-day Adventist um, hospital. Yeah. So the ethical response to that would be that if you get accepted to one of these programs, um, you would withdraw your diecast application. Um, that would be the ethical response to that question. <laughs> because if you get accepted, um, they want you to tell them if you're going to go or not. And if, you're, if you tell them you're going to go, but then you find out you're going to go to another program, they've like held that spot for you. Most would want a pretty quick response. You could ask them, like, can I have a week to think about it or can I have whatever to think about it? But most, if they've accepted you, they want you to respond that you want to go or not. Um, yeah. So, like, for if you get into the next to the program for school, could you possibly go to school or does that not? The programs where you get graduate units, depending on how many graduate units you get, you can get financial aid or not. Like Cal Poly, they get 12 units of graduate units, but that's not enough to qualify for financial aid. So you'd have to look at how many graduate units you get and what the schools or the states, whatever, um, requirements are for financial aid. If you're doing an MS program, then you will be eligible for financial aid. But if you're just doing a DI, some of them have enough graduate units in the DI that you would qualify for financial aid. And that's one of the things we're trying to do with Cal Poly's is see if we can increase the graduate units offered so at least the students who come to Cal Poly could get financial aid, even if they're not getting like a full master's degree. Um, so yeah, that would definitely be something to look into. Um, other things I'll say about that, I think, I think I'll just leave this here. Okay, working. Um, so can you work? Can you not work? The internships will generally say this on that document, but you can always ask. Yeah. No, totally okay. <laughs> yeah, so she asked, do they ever plan to combine the master's and the DI here at Cal Poly? I think we hope to. We just had a meeting about it yesterday. We've had lots of meetings about it over the years. We hope to. Um, I don't see it happening in the next one or two years, but we do hope to before that 2024. Um, but there's a lot of road bumps on how we'll do it because one of the things that we're worried about is if we combine it, it might limit diversity of our dietetic applicants because now we're getting dietetic applicants from like all over the place where if we maybe combined it, we might get more just internal applicants. Um, there's a lot of roadblocks, but we're trying and <laughs> we want to, Katie wants to, I mean, I would like to, um, we had the assistant to the dean at our meeting yesterday. He wants to, the dean wants to. He just wants it to be 25 people, which is a little bit more than this community can handle in a DI because we don't have big hospitals, you know? So yeah, your face, John. Yeah, it's like, yeah, 25 people is, is a huge internship, so we need to find like a happy medium between that. And it's especially hard now that Ash has their internship because they use a lot of the preceptors that Cal Poly does. And so the preceptors are kind of like maxed out with interns, you know, but we want to. Yeah. It's the way of the future and we don't want to be behind. So we're going to try our best. 
Um, working, yeah. So yeah, she says, you guys can read this, but some places allow you to work. Some places don't. You can search for it. But you can also talk to applicants. Like Cal Poly doesn't recommend you work. I worked the entire time during my internship. Um, I had a different director than Katie Facilius, but it's the same kind of preceptors in town. Some of them are still preceptors. I worked the entire time until May when I was just like, I'm sick of working, but it wasn't like my internship is so hard. I'm going to quit. It was like, I just am done working. Like I'm going to be an RD soon. I don't need to like hustle it right now anymore. I can take a little time off. Um, but I also worked a job where I could work nights and weekends. So that was easy. I mean, I worked as a bartender and a waitress and I made a lot of money and it paid for my grad school. Um, and it was food service experience, customer service experience. Um, Charmin, she was my grader last year and she is in the Cal Poly, was in the Cal Poly internship. She graded for me during the Cal Poly internship and she graded, graded clinical, which took 10 hours a week. So you can do it. Some programs have no problem with it. Other programs are more like cautious about it. But if you're really in a position where you're like, I really want to come to this program, but I need a little extra cash, see what you could do. And even, I think sometimes even offering like, well, could I be a grader or could I be, you know, maybe work with some of the professors at the university. Sometimes when it's internal work, I think directors don't feel as threatened by it um, than if it's external work. Um, so you never know. But I think that can be a good option and just make you feel a little bit, a little bit crazy because you'll do two things, but a little bit sane because you're making some money while you're spending the money to be there, you know. Um, it helped me feel better, you know. So, and pick a job where you're going to make a lot of money or get good experience, like waitress or bartend or like something, <laughs> something where you can make, make big bang for your buck or get good experience. That's what I would say. Um, distance programs. So distance programs, um, these are like kind of like online internships where you're going to meet virtually with your fellow interns probably once a week um, via Zoom or Skype or something. And you may be allowed to live in your hometown um, and have your preceptors be similar ones to your hometown. So some of these distance internships will find preceptors for you, but other distance, distance internships will have you find your preceptors. Um, and so this can be a good opportunity for those who want to stay in a location or for those who already have a lot of contacts. Um, like maybe you already know a lot of people at a hospital or a nursing home or within community and they would be your preceptor. You could do a distance internship. Um, I have Siobhan Burns. She's actually doing an ISPE, but it is a distance internship. So she really wanted to stay in town. I don't actually think she applied to Cal Poly or Ash. I can't remember but she didn't get in her first round and second round she applied for a distance internship. She got into Long Beach, but she's been here this whole time so far and she's gonna go to Long Beach for like the second half of the year, but she's been able to find a lot of her rotations here and stay here in the community where she can live at home and save money and that's been you know, really nice for her. When is the time right? Um, this is Heather Donovan, so I will read it because she works here now. This is her. You never would have expected. She never would have expected to be working here. I know you advised becoming a DTR, which I did, and my program directors really like to see it in applicants. I wish I would have taken the GRE, which you also advised. Take our advice. Um, <laughs> since I ended up having to take it during my program, which was tricky, being flexible is extremely important. Looking back, I wasn't ready to move out of state immediately after I graduated. I decided to apply for this program because it felt like the right time for me. I think some graduates may feel like they need to apply right away, but getting work experience in the meantime, I think is the main reason that I was accepted. This path really worked for me and I'm really glad that it did because the program I was 100% committed to wanting this career. And actually all her work experience before she got into her internship got her the job at Cal Poly. She had a lot of food service experience before she went to her internship and now she teaches food service here. So it wasn't, she didn't even work as an RD. She wasn't even an RD and we hired her because she had all this experience. She took her RD and then, you know, now she's an RD, but we liked her because of all her experience and now she got a job here. Um, so you never know what, what can happen. 
the ISPs are interesting. So the ISPs, it's um, Individualized Supervised Practice Pathway. And um, these only open up after the match if you haven't gotten in. So they're not available during the match. They're programs that have supervised practice and will count as your internship, but they're not available during the match or to apply to them right now. You can only apply to them if you did not get into the match. And there's quite a few of them. You can search for them on DieCast. Um, lots of them are distance. A few of them are not, but most of them are distance. So this, this is Siobhan right here. She gave a presentation um, at Prado for caring for patients with diabetes and temporary housing, you know? And she's staying here to do most of her rotation. Golden Gate Dietetic Internship is an ISP. So if you're from the Bay Area and you know people and you apply and don't get in, you have that as a second round opportunity. Um, Pepperdine has ISPs. Long Beach, San Bernardino has ISPs. There's quite a few of them out there. So after you finish this, you can take your RD exam. And then these next slides, I had a, a student volunteer make for me. And they're pretty cool, but she just highlighted a few programs that she found interesting. Um, and kind of the cost, the monthly rent, you know, population. You go to Long Beach, they have more taco restaurants than anywhere else, you know, just stuff about them. Um, stipends, tuition, in-state versus out-of-state. And I can add these to the PolyLearn. She just sent me these. Um, Alabama, 16 students. Tuition is really expensive if you're not from Alabama, which I don't think any of you guys are from Alabama. So you might just not want to look at this one <laughs> unless you have that trust fund. Um, but it's cheap to live in Alabama. <laughs> yeah, anyways. Um, you know, they, they do have distance opportunities, so it's possible you could apply to this and live somewhere else. And one thing that's really cool about this one is you can go to Italy during your dietetic internship, and it counts as credits towards your dietetic internship. So it might be worth that extra money, you know, being able to travel abroad and really get a unique experience. Um, that's pretty cool. It also, it's an MS program. So you're not just doing your DI, you're also getting your master's. Wellness work days, we've had quite a few people go to this one. Um, this one is also a dietetic distance internship. They have a lot of students that they enroll. Um, tuition is not that bad. You don't have to take the GRE. Um, headquarters is in Boston, but you can work off-site and they have lots of different concentrations and then Gulf Coast so eight month program that's really fast you know um, you can be taking your RD test in probably eight and a half months it usually takes the preceptors a couple weeks to send that in um, also distance 30 students tuition is not that bad eight months eight thousand dollars I mean to be done with it not that bad. Um, GRE not required. Yeah, you can do in your local setting. So that's kind of nice. Um, lots of flexibility with some of the distance education programs. And then last one she picked was Atascadero State Hospital. Um, it's just up the road in Atascadero. They don't require the GRE. You do get paid to do it, and they have some housing assistance. They do the fall match. So um, they match in fall. The applications are due like September 25th, and the program starts in January. So most of the programs do spring match, but they do the fall match. And we've had quite a few Cal Poly students go to ASH and work at ASH and have careers at ASH. Actually, one of my students got her interview at ASH, so she applied to WIC and ASH for fall, and she got interviews at both, so she just had her interview with ASH, so um, that's exciting, you know? And they pay their RDs and DTRs pretty well. I sent out that DTR job opportunity, so it's not a bad career at all. I have friends, two pretty good friends who work there and love it, um, so yeah. 
How are you guys doing? <laughs> Surviving? Yeah. Yeah, so to become a DTR, I think I have a presentation on that. Um, to become a DTR, after you graduate, you guys will get a verification statement. Um, there's, there's actually a different, it's not through DieCast that you like apply to become a DTR or anything. There's a website called Reps. Um, and let's see if I can pull it up. So, let me look for reps. Here we go. Repscdr.net. So registration eligibility processing system. Um, I think that this is me. And I'm this. Oh, I have to remember my access code. Okay, I have my access code like in a binder somewhere. Anyways, you'll go through reps, no Wikipedia, You'll go through reps, and reps will ask you similar information um, to DieCast. It will ask you like demographic information. It will ask you what school you went to, who your DPD director is. Um, you'll put me, and then it will send me an email saying that you want me to upload. I have to upload two things, transcripts and verification statement. So if after you graduate, you think you want to become a DTR, you'll have to send me official copies of your transcripts and transcripts from anywhere you've been. I'll save them onto OneDrive and then I'll be able to upload them into reps. And the verification statement is something that's automatically generated after you graduate and I'll keep a copy for myself and you'll get seven copies of it. So you won't have to submit that, I'll have that. But you'll go to this rep site, you'll fill out what it's asking, you'll put me, it will send me an email, and then I'll verify that yes, you've done all your DPD requirements, here's your transcripts, here's your verification statements. Then you'll get an email saying, you are eligible to take the DTR exam, please schedule it at one of these testing centers. And usually the testing centers, there's one in Atascadero, um, but depending on which company they use, there's testing centers all over you know, California. And you go to one of those testing centers and you take the proctored exam. I think the fee for DTR is like $150. Um, but that's all you have to do. Um, there are study resources like on CDR. And I have some too on like what types of questions would be on the DTR exam. But it's not too bad of a thing to do. You know, it's pretty easy. Um, and that's a great place to get more work experience to get higher paid work experience, you know, once you have that credential. Be a DTR for six months, a year. I mean, I've had people with DTRs for a long time, you know, and then decide to apply. Yeah. I have more information on it too I can post um, later. Yeah, Lauren. Like, if you do take time off work, you can do check for a college internship, which is the recommended you still have to. Yeah, so that's a good point. If you take time off, would you still recommend two letters from faculty? You'll still have to have two letters from faculty. So if you do whatever you're gonna do <laughs> until you apply, keep in touch with faculty, you know? Um, and maybe before you leave or take that year off, be like, hey, I'm gonna take a gap year. I'm gonna go do whatever. Um, but when I come back, I'm really thinking I'm gonna apply to be an RD. Could I come? talk with you when I get back, you know, or would you be willing to write me a letter in the future? And that will hopefully help them remember that they said yes, you know? <laughs> yeah. So one of the people I asked asked me where she sends things for the she sent it to, like, do they send it directly to us? So, we send it to the yeah, so after, I think it was December 15th, you can go into DieCast and you'll enter the names and the emails of the people who are writing you letters, and DieCast will send them a link saying, Shelby has requested that you write them a letter, please upload it here, and then she'll upload it there. Yeah. So for the time being, for the time being um, tell her to hold on to it until she gets that email from you. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Sapna.
Yeah, you're, that's a good question. I'm probably not the best person to ask, answer it. Um, Dr. Nazmi might be a little bit better or even a representative from our public health department here. But public health is much broader. Well, I would say masters of science. So we have um, specializations within science. So if you got your masters of science in nutrition, you're mostly gonna be focusing on nutritional science. If you get your masters of public health, public health encompasses a much wider scope. It could be community health, it could be water safety, it could be smoking cessation, it could be mental health, it could be sleep health, it could be um, promoting breastfeeding, it could be um, health of like how cities are built, city planning, building cities to impact health, you know, reduction in like obesogenic environments. Um, it's just a wider scope and with public health, I think there's probably more opportunity for like international or global health. Lots of jobs request or are only for people with an MPH. So I think there are more opportunities with the MPH in a broader array of jobs. If you're thinking you just want to do nutrition, I think a master's in nutrition is 100% great. But if you're thinking, maybe I wanna have a broader range of opportunities, um, public health could be good. I mean, without me being the expert, we could probably just do like a Google. Um, Yeah, I mean, there. I think there's a lot more opportunities. Um, I was hoping to just get like some bullet points, <laughs> not like an essay. But um, you know what I would do is I would go, we have a master's in public health now. We have a public health department now at Cal Poly. I would go over there um, and talk to them. Like, so here's some things. Dietitian nutritionist, emergency management specialist, um, so like CDC, Red Cross, epidemiologist, Dr. Nazmi's specialty is epidemiology, um, health educators, community health workers, microbiologists. Uh, no, you can't be a microbiologist with a master's in public health. Sorry. <laughs> I got my, ma my bachelor's in microbiology and no, but whatever. Um, occupational health and safety. So like OSHA stuff, um, public health nurse. You'd also need a nursing degree, social community service stuff like that. But I would ask, um, publichealth.org is probably a good resource. Let's see. I don't want to select a category. I just want to know. Anyways. Yeah, I'd ask the public health department. They'd be the best resource. But I think there's a broader range of opportunities. Um, a lot of jobs for nutrition will say something like master's in nutrition or related field and public health is a related field, especially with a bachelor's and a DI in nutrition, you would be very qualified, you know, I think for most of those jobs. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> and I'll have fun trying to figure those out. Yeah, if you studied abroad, send transcripts from abroad as well. Yeah, if it's through Cal Poly, it usually is just on the Cal Poly. Um, sometimes it comes on the Cal Poly transcripts, but if it was through another college, yeah, probably need separate transcripts. So for DICAS, you send them to DICAS, but for the DTR, you send them to me. Yeah, so if you're not gonna do the DTR, or DieCast, you don't have to send them anywhere. If you're applying for an internship, you send them to DieCast. If you're not applying for an internship, but you might wanna be a DTR, you send them to me. And they have to be official copies. Um, anything else? Okay. We survived another Friday. Um, go look at internships and yeah. You should be doing something every week. You should be like entering classes. Yeah.
enter classes. Well, okay, so honestly, I think more important would be to look at programs, especially if you're considering an MSDI, to figure out if there's any dates that you need to be prepared for. And then after you've looked at if you're gonna do maybe an MSDI where there might be early dates, then look, then start working on your die cast. Yeah. But every week, that's what Dr. Grant would say, do something every single week.